Oh, hello there, Chuck. <laughs> I didn't see you there. How are you? Hmm? Good. Just uh, editing the episode. What's up? <laughs> What's up? Oh, you commoner and your common talk. I guess I'm what you would say, <laughs> doing not much. <laughs> what is this? Chuck. Chuck, it's me, your pal Brady. I'm practicing patronizing, so I'm working on being more condescending to people. <laughs> oh, Ooh. do you have any idea my man can get some crumpets around here? <laughs> uh, oh, wh- why are you doing this? You know, for our Patreon, we've been asking people to patronize our page, and I didn't <sighs> want to ask them to do something I wasn't willing to do it myself, so I figured I'd get some practice. In. Oh, God. Brady, no, that's, huh? <sighs> that's what? not what it means. Oh, no? Listen. Listeners can go to our Patreon page, pick the level you want to contribute. Each level has special rewards. Okay. Like exclusive life after minisodes. Or not safe for work bloopers? Uh, Or like a monthly collection of deconstruction memes. And even personal consultations or meet up with your favorite host, Chuck and Brady? Yeah. Brady. Patreon.com slash the life (laughs) after. I guess even you could find it. (laughs) Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Life After. I am your host, one of your hosts, Chuck Parson, and I am Brady Harden. And uh, we this is the Life After. <laughs> this is the Life After. Um, we have a uh, really exciting guest today, Cindy Wang Brandt. Um, Cindy is uh, the host of the Parenting Forward podcast, author of Parenting Forward. Um, uh, Huffington Post contributor. I didn't know uh, that one. I didn't know see, that. See, now one. you know. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, is a is a former evangelical fundamentalist Christian um, turned progressive, uh, turned uh, something maybe a little bit more ambiguous. But we'll talk to her about that. And uh, we're super excited to have her on the show. Cindy, how's it going over there? Good. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Cool. So this is a this is a complete this is an international call where where uh, Cindy is in Taiwan mm-hmm. and we are right here in good old St. Louis, Missouri. Well, it's not so good old right now because we're about to close our last abortion clinic, but that's our own. Uh, kind of, uh, <laughs> it's our own struggle. So horrible. Jesus, dark turn at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, well, it's true. Yeah, it's out there, man. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. I'm actually going we're to America to the- uh, tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, crazy. No way. Where are you? Yeah, headed? I'm going to um Tennessee actually to attend Rachel Held Evans' funeral. I was going I was wanting to ask you about her. You had uh you were you were friends with her yeah, or well, you, she I don't know what your relationship was like. Forward to my book. Right. Um, yeah, so I'll I'll be doing that but and then we're spending a month um in in the states just with family. My husband is American, so we do go back to okay. see family. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh well, uh, preliminary welcome back, I guess. <laughs> welcome to the United States. Yeah. Like, almost. Yeah, cool. I'm excited. Just, you know, lots going on before having to travel for a month, so. I was astounded by your book. I loved it. Um, I was so excited about reading it because I read your book right after reading Jamie Lee Finch's book. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, cool. right, right after, it was just kind of like a one-two punch. Yeah. And um, I was able to listen to your audio book. Mm. And it really hit me because it was my first time doing anything about parenting since leaving the faith. Mm. Do people tell you that a lot? Like, or not since leaving the faith, but maybe like since leaving fundamentalism or whatever their, you know, main like oppressive, like faith background is. Well, the reason I started writing and talking about these issues is because I feel like there's a huge vacuum. I feel like there are a lot of people right. who are going through what I call a faith shifting, which is uh, my friend Kathy Escobar's phrase, but just like going through radical changes from our childhood faith who are becoming parents or who are parents. And, and I, it's like this huge topic that nobody seems to be addressing. Um, and so I've tried to do that. I've tried to create the space to talk about this. How in the world are we supposed to pass on values? Because parenting is largely about values, right? B- besides, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, our spirituality is a huge part of formation, and, and so there's this big thing that we're supposed to be responsible for. And then we also have all these wounds and, and trauma. And it just was like, this is an impossible task. And, 
and no one's talking about it. So let's yeah. at least talk about it. I don't claim to have the answers, but I also feel like it's it's just kind of like the next question in deconstruction because, um, you know, and uh, people throw these terms around deconstruction, reconstruction, um, but I feel like- so We use them a lot on the show, so. Yeah. Right, and so I think parenting is an, a very natural way um, to talk about reconstruction because we have to, we were raising mm. little human beings. Um, and so how, mm -hmm. how do we want to like go back and do we want to burn everything down and start off fresh with, with our kids or do we want to like keep the good and, you know, or leave the, leave the bad and keep the good or what, like, how do we do this thing? Um, and so that's what my mm, book right. is trying to address. What, what is healthy um, spirituality, how do we incorporate like, you know, mainstream parenting advice, what we know about science and brain development and, and social mm -hmm. issues and, and incorporate that into, um, yeah, just how, how we raise children. I feel like, uh, the way that we were raised as conservative evangelicals, I'm assuming that you both were raised conservative evangelical that's correct, correct yeah. okay yes yes yeah, yeah the way we were raised is so twisted and distorted in so many ways right. that it can be daunting to feel like we can possibly um know what we're doing <laughs> what it is, is it, what? it's a tangled web isn't it? i mean it's like it's really difficult to separate like mm -hmm. your parents and you talk about this uh, a bit on uh, like it kind of actually probably comes up pretty often in your podcast is that like you, parents have good intentions, right. so it can be really hard to separate the wheat from the chaff, as it were. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Trigger warning. Bible verse. But yeah. <laughs> wait, um, yeah. So yeah. Um, I was going to ask a question, but go ahead, Brady. <laughs> what What did your upbringing look like? What What was kind of your fundamentalism flavor? Yeah, thanks for asking that. I think a lot of people get confused because I, I generally say I grew up evangelical. So a lot of people think I grew up in a Christian family, um, but I actually didn't. My my parents were irreligious. Well, um, so I was born into a non-religious family, but um, they I live in Taiwan. So they sent me to a school for um, missionary children. And the ethos of the school is like not just conservative evangelical, but it's run by missionaries. So like the most zealous and fervent mm. of all conservative evangelicals, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was that, uh, it was that environment that I was kind of converted and discipled, which was the language we used. And, um, and, right. and it was a huge yes, yeah. part of my formation because my adolescence, right? Like the most, significant part and i mean writing my book i learned about our brain development and how in adolescence our brain kind of experiences another burst of like spiritual energy almost where it like mm. it's it's just very impactful and and i was in that environment in the 90s um sort of the height of evangelicalism mm. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, and so that was that was my my background, and and I took it really far. I, you know, I didn't. I wasn't a nominal Christian. God forbid. I was lukewarm, right? So I was very. Uh -huh. Well, I spit you out of my mouth. I yeah. Mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was quite uh, devout. I I went off to a Christian yeah. college, even though I came from a non-religious background. That's kind of a big deal. Um, like I chose. Right. Like I, it wasn't like I was born in a Christian family and just expected to go to Christian college. Like I made a commitment sure. to go to a Christian college because I just believe God wanted me to do that. And, and I went to seminary and became a missionary myself for five and a half years. I was in the mission field. Wow. Mm. So I have very high credentials in evangelicalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you attended you attended Wheaton, and you also attended seminary, correct? Right. I went to Fuller Seminary, which is a one. Oh, you went to Fuller. Yes, okay. which is a step left of Wheaton, which was very good. Correct. It was yeah. good. Which, good but time. like in the grand scheme of left, is like <laughs> yeah, still pretty pretty close to the center. Right, right, right. Yeah, I've definitely moved left yeah. to Fuller as well. Um, right. But it was right. it was such an sure. important step out of the, right. the bubble that I had been in. So I. I don't know. I, hmm. I appreciate Fuller for what the role that it played in my life. Sure, sure, sure. I'm kind of cool. pulling you on the, on, so to the direction that you're going. That, that actually, yeah, it leads me to uh, my next question, which is, so you, 
as a public as a public figure, you kind of exist in the evangelical or like progressive Christian world. Right. Personally, it, from what I've read uh, that you've written about it, it seems like you're sort of in like a, a place of rethinking or reconsidering. Or right. you're in kind did you of read my blog post on "Am I Still that. Christian"? <laughs> I, yes, I did. I sure did. I read that one. Yeah, yeah I, <laughs> I really liked what I really liked the way you approach it. But could mm-hmm. you, for our audience, could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I I feel like I think I'm still in the same place where I'm kind of tired of this public negotiation of am I Christian? Am I not? It doesn't seem to matter sure. because I can say I'm a Christian, and all the Christians will say I'm not. Um, and right. I can say I can say I'm agnostic, but I feel like it kind of denies you know a lot of my background and story that i mm-hmm. I, I don't know mm-hmm. if i'm ready to do that um mm-hmm. and in the end i just think faith is a fluid thing and even non-faith i think is fluid i think hu- humanity being human is fluid and we're always changing yeah. Yeah, yeah. and and so uh, at any point to capture where i am in a podcast or a blog post it's not going to last so it feels sure, somewhat sure. It's pointless no yeah it's just no yeah. I've, no- I've noticed that's a theme of your work is this this, this constant progression yes this, like- yes and i mean it's but you did answer it's right now what are you what what is your religious affiliation tell us right now yeah and like i said right. in the blog post like i don't do anything <laughs> christian i don't pray i don't go to church I right. don't do Bible study. Right. Mm. And so it kind of feels like, uh, you know, <laughs> what, what does right. it mean? And, um, but I, I care a great deal about human flourishing. Um, and I feel mm-hmm. like I, I still feel like spirituality is a big part of that, whatever that looks like for people. I feel like myth is a part of human history and sustained civilization. So I am fascinated by my story that, and yeah. the narrative that drives our human behavior. Um, and, and it's just frankly easier for me to do the Christian narrative because I know it best. Um, I am very interested in liberal theologies because it allows me to still explore my curiosity with narrative and the Bible and, and mm-hmm, all of those mm-hmm, things, mm-hmm. but still like can say, I don't believe any of it is true. <laughs> like liberal theology makes right. room for that and, and allows me to embrace right. science and, and modern, you know, and all the new things that we're learning about the world and, and to, um, to reimagine the stories or something new and to not fear any divine backlash for, for following my own curiosity. Um, and so, so yeah, I don't, and and that's why I'm still really happy to be in my niche right now talking about parenting and progressive faith, because I think that it's just not, I feel like it's not talked about. I feel like there's still not Mm. as many resources on the progressive side of things in terms of spirituality um, compared mm-hmm. to the overwhelming amount of literature and resources from the um, fundy side. Oh God. Yeah. It just never ends. Man. Right. <laughs> I was going to say with as much as you're talking about storytelling and the importance of mythology, mm-hmm. um, that's right up my alley. I'm, I'm a huge Joseph Campbell nerd. I can talk about the monomyth for hours. Um, what are kind of some of the sacred texts that you're finding now outside of religion that are kind of maybe even useful for your kids or story time or movies or anything like that? I'm not really exploring anything religious um, at this point. Like, right, I'm right. Really, yeah, not, I, we don't necessarily mean religious. Oh, okay. Then I think it's just pop culture. Yeah. Um, I think, sure, yeah, yeah, I think it's it's what's being, you know, the representation that is popular that my kids are, are seeing in the world. They're, you know, they're teenagers. Both my kids are teenagers. Now they're very into the YouTube culture. Um, and I don't mm-hmm. fall. Mm-hmm. I probably should be a little bit more involved in their watching. <laughs> I don't know, but I do listen to them telling me um, what's going on. And so, yeah, just trying to help them process it, uh, uh-huh. you know. And are they into like unpacking videos or? watching other kids play video that, games that, yeah kind of. watching other oh i mean i don't understand yeah. i wrote about it in my book i don't understand it but they love uh-huh. it uh-huh. so yeah i want to you know i'm not i'm very pro technology i'm not one to be like oh 
technology is rotting my kids' brains. Like I'm interested in, okay, tell me about what, you know, what this world is like and, and I want to learn, you know, that's, I feel like that's the posture that I, I promote in my book as well. Like we, yeah, I picked up on that. I th- I've liked that you weren't against technology because I think that making sweeping generalizations like that is kind of obnoxious and it's not, it's reckless Yeah. But when it comes to like what's available to our kids these days and what they're able to actually absorb and learn from. Right. It's phenomenal. And to kind of be able to tap into that, I think is really important. Yeah. And I think it's important to, to learn, to, to know, um, to listen to our kids, right. To, to know what, mm. Yeah, what mm. what their what their mm-hmm. world is because it's so different from our perspective. You know, the world changes right. so quickly, and our experience of technology is right. very different from theirs. They have a different history and background. Right. And so, yeah, I'm all about kind of this mutual learning and growing together with our children. Mm. Very cool. Yeah, and that, I mean that's so that is so contrary to the fundamentalist approach, right? Yeah. I mean, like the fundamentalist approach is very, and, and I mean we could spend this whole interview talking about the differences between what you're what you're proposing and what fundamentalist was, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the fundamentalist view is, and I we probably should spend a lot of it talking about that, but uh, like the fundamentalist view is basically like you as the as the parent are the purveyor of truth, and your job is to like weed out any like information that doesn't match your own worldview so that your kid doesn't turn out too different from you i guess you know what i mean right there's a huge fear of course it's like the the f word and fundamentalism right um Uh, everything's driven by fear and parenting is very much driven by fear um and fundamentalism and that's that just sucks that's not a good way to parent (laughs) Yeah, and I mean, yeah. I like Elizabeth Gilbert talks about this. Like, we don't want to deny fear. It's a human emotion. Um, and especially sure. in parents, we love our kids so much. Of course, we're going to be afraid um, for them. Right. But, but it shouldn't make the decisions, right? Like, it should just be mm. something we validate and listen to, but we don't let it drive our parenting decisions. Come on. So, okay. So, uh, you sort of have to come at at how do i how do i want to say this okay so you said earlier that that parenting a lot of parenting is about values right but the problem that i think a lot of uh post evangelicals have is that you, it's it's difficult to establish a system of values or or like a a, a definable one mm-hmm. right like you might you obviously live in such a way that promotes your values, but it's really hard to like comment on where those are coming from now that you don't have the Bible and now that you don't have your pastor and your community and all that stuff. Yeah. So, um, another, another really interesting, uh, blog post you wrote is why the golden rule is inadequate. And you're kind of talking about, um, your, your approach to value systems and morality. So Mm. I guess sort of as the foundation for how you go about, instilling values in your kids how do you yourself go what is your process for for establishing a a new worldview and for establishing a moral uh you know code or whatever however you want to say it yeah such such a simple question that i should be able to answer in three bullet points right well yeah no but i i like that you (laughs) choose not to well i want to say a few things so first of all i I think that having the pastor determine our values is really shitty. <laughs> so right, I, I right. much prefer this. Uh, you know how we used to make fun of cafeteria Christianity? How that's so horrible that you pick and choose mm, yeah. values how and how, yeah, how, sure. yeah, how ungodly that was. Now I love it. Like now I think that's a great way to approach values. Like, Oh yeah. I think, okay. I think we should like, I, I think like I'm all about uh, honoring our own intuition these days. Like we decide we have autonomy and discernment and we can decide what we want to follow or what we, what values we want to live by. Um, so that's the first thing that I'll say because fundamentalists fear chaos and that's why they have all these mm. rules and systems in place to make sure there's no chaos. But that's a, that's mm-hmm. a fear mongering tactic because it's not chaotic. It, it's not chaotic for people to actually gain agency to decide what values they want to live by. It's actually 
good right. thing, right? So that's the first thing I'll say. And the second thing is that a lot of people, and I think parents post deconstruction, are worried that there's just going to be nothing for the kids, right? No values, no mm -hmm. system, nothing mm -hmm. to to uh, to guide them. And and to that, I'll say that none of us exist in a vacuum. There is no moral or value vacuum, right? Like we all mm -hmm. are shaped mm -hmm. by something. Um, and and so I think that the best approach as a parent is to kind of again like i said i want to see it as a partnership like i'm not giving my children the values that they have to live by i want to help them develop their own i want them to decide wow. mm. what i want them to be cafeteria people right but they get to choose the yeah, dishes yeah. That, that they want and as as am i i'm a, i want to model that um and so Cool. Like any value that I have, for example, I care about poor people. Let's just say one value, caring about um, the poor. That's something that I personally do value. That's something that I choose out of the spectrum of teachings that I actually learned from Christianity, caring for the poor. But I'm not going to shove that down my kids' throats, right? I'm going to offer it as... Hey, right. this is something I care a lot about. Um, I think I think we all should care about. But you know, you you know, I want to give my children the same freedom that I want for myself. Um, mm. So I think it's just yeah, just a matter of picking and choosing which ones. And and I think that it's, so, it's such a good thing to allow our children to listen to their own heart. What is it that you know? What is it that breaks their hearts? You know, what is it that they're drawn to? Because we don't all have the same level of concern for every cause and every value um so mm -hmm. i've been finding myself trying to instill ones that are important to me and to my son mm. uh, we've been having a lot of conversations about how to approach people who have different skin colors and come from different backgrounds mm -hmm. and um yeah, from where i came from you know it was just all white people mm -hmm. and I love that he's in a position now and he's living in a world where there's more diversity around him. Mm -hmm. And he actually goes to a school that's, it's a private school that has a lot of diversity. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, isn't it cool to just see your kids kind of being brought up in a world where things are just different than what we are brought up with? Yeah. It's so healing. You know? Yeah. And, and I think that they, I think what, what we want them to do is to have as much authenticity and truth as possible mm. in their lives. And so I think with the diversity, it's like that the diversity is more true. It's more, it's a better representation. There's a better representation of the world right? that they live in. Yeah. Um, and so I think, yeah, I, I feel like that's, I want to be a truth telling parent. So, uh, so part of your deconstruction, the, the, the way that you describe it is that, there's a point, and this is true for all of us, there's a point where your values don't line up with the system's values, basically. Mm -hmm. And I really like that you make a distinction between you, between the person that you are and what you would, what you would otherwise do and the, the sort of morals or, or approach that is like forced on you by the, by the system. Right. So it's like, you like i guess like a quote that i grabbed from one of your blogs says decon deconversion is about coming back to the person you already were which is like a really that that was like a way that i haven't actually thought about this as much as i think about deconversion <laughs> you yeah know? well yeah and this is a complicated uh issue that i've i thought about i've thought a lot about and i don't know I, I, I don't know if I have the answer because I talked about this with my husband because I want to I want to say that I've always kind of been the same person. It's just that I was kind mm -hmm. of manipulated into the evangelical system, but I always was somebody who like cared deeply about people and and I you know even me wanting to like please God was like I just wanted to do the right thing. And that's what eventually led me to deconstruction and it's still what drives me now. Um, just like this person who just like wants to do the right thing, you know? And but my mm -hmm, husband was mm -hmm. challenged me on that. He was like, I, you always say that you're the same person, but you're clearly not. <laughs> hmm, and that's uh -huh. also yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. Like that's also really sure. true. I'm not that. I am not. How are you different? The young evangelical 
I mean, just everything. You, I mean, you know. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Talk, it's, it's everything, but it's I, like. Yeah, the way I believe, the way I, um, you know, made decisions, the way the, my posture, like everything changed with, with my faith shift. And, mm-hmm. and so I, I don't know if I can make that decision that I desperately want to make. I think, I think, uh-huh. yeah, like, I don't know. There's just something about wanting to be consistent and integrated or with the Mm -hmm. that i used to be but maybe i need to give that up um i don't know i'm still thinking through this sure 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 well it's like yeah we all i mean we're all yeah i get yeah i guess that is the question like we're all shaped by events that happen to us i mean it's like nature and nurture right right? the classic question of nature and nurture exactly am i am i like this or am i like this because of some outside factor but what i like about it, it it's just i think that's just a really good perspective to at least consider Mm -hmm. that we are returning to the person that we already were you know what i mean like it's like a we got pulled i mean we it's fair to say that we were coerced into believing or thinking or acting a certain way because of x y and z right right? and that we wouldn't have otherwise and that honestly in the in in a lot of a lot of situations in that moment we knew was not consistent with what the kind of life we would want to live right we had to get so so it's really nice to be able to say it yeah Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We had to get so comfortable with dissonance and, and just contradicting our own intuition mm-hmm. and, uh, and distrusting our feelings and, and all of those things. And it's like, it's really nice to be able to say like, it's because, because deconversion and deconstruction is a scary thing. It's really nice to be able to sit back and say, well, this is an opportunity for me to like become who I would have been yes. or would be or who mm. I actually am. Yes, you know what I mean? Yes. I, it's I like there's that. something comforting about that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I love that. I, I think and I try to you know, this is this is gonna sound really sad, but I often imagine what my life, you know, the alternative timeline it would have been if I had I not been raised evangelical. Right. Where would right, I be? Right, what right. would I have done? And it's you know, it's a it's a sad mental exercise because I can't unwind time. But um, Mm -hmm. it's part of my work because I'm thinking about how do we raise the next generation to not to not have to Mm. go through what we went through. Um, And so I found myself having to mourn that person to kind of having to imagine what he would be like and what he would do. Yeah, I think that might be really helpful. There's a mourning process, right? I know. I don't. I think it's too. It's too hard for me to think about more. <laughs> you know, like, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, hard. Yeah. It's a hard thing to do to grieve something that you're never gonna have. Um, but sure, but I th- yeah. I can see how that could be a, uh, a a good thing and necessary thing. Well, you know, we're actually due for a break, so uh, we're gonna take a quick break. Um, when we get back, a little bit more this conversation with Cindy Wang Brandt. We'll be right back right after this. If you were going to die tonight, do you know where Stop. you Stop. Would... Just tell them about our website. Oh, just tell them to go to thelifeafter.org? Yes, they can go now, even without accepting Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> thelifeafter.org. We have a blog, contact page, a link to our Facebook page, and more. All right, thelifeafter.org. Heavenly. Welcome back to the life. <laughs> yeah, welcome back to life after this is Brady. I'm definitely Chuck. leaving and in here me with... saying that Brady's a pain. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, and we're here with Cindy. Cindy, I don't get to talk that much about um, what it was like. Because so I started parenting right right as I was deconstructing mm. and single parenting, ah. and so <laughs> I had to like you know, go through a lot of weird financial stuff because I was supposed to be a pastor and that wasn't, so I lost my career and then my divorce and it coming Uh. out um, all at the same time of like having a baby. So parenting was so strange for me. And then with leaving the the faith, not having like any sort of resources made for somebody like Mm me, you Mm -hmm. know? But like (laughs) one thing I want to appreciate, talk to you about and and say that I appreciate was when reading your book, Mm -hmm. 
I never felt on the outside because the way that she worded everything wasn't to favor moms over dads or par- you know married parents or whatever. Um, you did a really good job, like including all of us weird parents that fit in the cracks without having to feel like we're sticking out like a sore thumb. I'm so glad you that know? you say that because I I don't know if I'm very intentional about it, but I I believe that. The work that I do is for everyone, um, even though it's branded mm. as parenting, because uh, part of what I say is that raising children with justice for justice is like a key strategy in, um, in creating a more just world. And everyone should be invested in mm. that conversation. And there's a lot of patriarchy in the parenting spaces where you know, it's all yeah. about the moms. And, and, and it is uh, because that's just the reality right now that mothers do do most of the child caring. Um, and mm-hmm. so I feel like, yeah, I want to subvert that paradigm. I want to say that dads and, and gay couples and, uh, you know, like everyone is invested, singles and uh, grandparents everyone is included in the conversation. So I appreciate you saying that you felt included. Another thing, another like interesting thing that the book I found from it was I just got off of done reading uh, Jamie Lee Finch's book. And before that, uh, Marlene Winnell's Marlene talks about parenting your, your inner child Mm -hmm. and kind of like uh, leaving the fold, leaving the fold. Yeah. Excuse me. (laughs) And she talks about, uh, caring for becoming the adult that you needed as a kid and kind of like going back into your memories and, and kind of caring for what you were lacking whenever you were in fundamentalism as a child. Mm -hmm. And my parents came from a pretty bad home life Mm -hmm. and kind of having to create a good home life for my son at the same time as Mm -hmm. deconstructing and questioning myself, your book kind of came as a double whammy to me, Mm -hmm. uh, parenting forward, like had to do with how am I going to be parenting my son but then i'm also reading it as what are the things that i can be providing for my son that i lacked as a kid Mm -hmm. and that i need to now as an adult Mm -hmm. go back and work the fuck out that shit so Mm -hmm. that i can kind of parent myself forward yeah i I, I, interject real quick and just say that like for anybody that's listening that's not a parent like this this book and like cindy's work is super cathartic because in, if nothing else I'm like reading what I wish my own childhood yes. would have looked mm-hmm. like you know or, or more closer to it and that there's something really healing about that to be able to gain some perspective and look back and say like oh well, this wasn't fair and I wish this had gone this way mm-hmm. and I wish I'd been able to communicate this or I wish my parents had listened to me in this scenario mm. etc and that that in and of itself is is awesome and yeah. I, I talk so about continue, this Brady. in my book oh, yeah. that uh, we don't want to use our children as like our therapy, but parenting right. kind of right, organically right. leads to kind of being therapeutic because you are almost forced or at least compelled to confront the toxic cycles that took root in our own lives. Um, and it's all about breaking that cycle and doing better for our kids. And, and yeah, I would agree that even if you don't have kids, that's, it's a good thing to do to break the cycle that was part of your own Mm. formation that was toxic, um, and to have a healthier life. And so, so yeah, I think parenting just kind of gives us that impetus, um, because, because Mm. we have to, if we want a better life for our kids. Right. Um, Mm. But but yes, it's uh, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard to break um, to break the cycle and the pattern because it's, mm. it's what we know. Mm-hmm. I just I love what you you were saying about not telling a kid how to be formed, but going alongside and forming the kid with them, mm-hmm. and kind of talking about what's important to them and bringing that out. Mm-hmm. What are some of the things that you're noticing from your own kids while doing that and practicing that? Well, I the the very first thing that I think about is I'm definitely not evangeli- evangelizing my kids, right? Like I'm not yeah. going to tell them what to believe. Um, and so it's been really encouraging to see my kids embrace that. Like they they will tell me often that I'm and. 
it's funny because they, okay, my kids still go to a conservative evangelical school, so they still have a lot of the evangelical teachings in their lives. And, Some of the influence, right. And I get mm -hmm. really nervous, right, naturally. Um, and, and I get triggered um, when they tell me things that they're learning. And yeah, I often just worry. And I, and I talk to them, I said, and I'm really honest with them. I said, honey, I'm just really concerned that you're going to learn these things that I learned when I was a kid and it was not good for me. And, and she'll come for me at this point. My daughter is 16. She'll be like, mom, don't, you don't need to worry. I am making decisions for myself. I don't really want you to tell me what is good and what is bad. I'm deciding for myself, you know? Wow. And I love that. Yeah. It's so empowering. It's a, it's it's a little so scary empowering. still because yeah, there's a part of me that just wants her to do as I say, <laughs> like, trust me, this is bad for you. <laughs> but that, right. that would be going against my own teaching, right? Like the point is that mm -hmm. she decides for herself. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's been encouraging. And I want that for, for everything, even, you know, even the best values that I have, we can't force people to be kind. We can't force people to be generous. Um, we, we want them to, to want that for themselves because that's how they'll actually embrace it and, and live it out um, in a way that's true to their personality and inclinations, right? So like, that's mm. what I want for my kids is like, you, you decide, you know, you decide you want to be a kind person. You decide you want to be this or that. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that I'm doing it. It's the thing about parenting is it takes a long time to see the results of your labor um, because right, they have right. to grow up. And <laughs> so, so we'll see. It's a slow burn. <laughs> Parenting is such a slow burn. Yeah. Uh, the last faith expression that I really had, I was a hardcore Calvinist and the church that I attended was so obsessed with corporal punishment, oh. uh, to the point where one of the pastors was out of like the main pastor was out of town, so the second in command kind of came in and did an entire sermon on how to spank babies starting from infants. Oh. And it was, oh my God, Cindy, I invited a friend that week, and the shame that I felt of having to sit through that horrible sermon. Um, horrible. And that church was so toxic in that sense because that same pastor, if your kid or if your child cried in the church, he would call them out and compared them to like stampeding cows. Oh and it was such like a, such like a hateful time. And, and, you know, and we were Calvinists, so they really love to put an emphasis on, you know, how evil and depraved children are. And, um, you know, we get obsessed with verses like we have to train them up the way that they'll go um which really just describes indoctrination you know, yeah, like, you so know if we brainwash them before they have their you know critical thinking skills then they won't stray from the path or whatever yeah but just seeing like the attitude now with parenting for me is different but i still at times feel like my son has to be perfect in public or something mm -hmm. uh, because that was kind of the expectations that were put upon us from right. a previous faith expression. Yeah. Um, I always ta I talk, I talk about the whole, um, the, the Island experiment. Like if you were on an Island where it's just you and your son, would you care about his behavior? Whatever is, is in question, you know, and a lot of times, mm -hmm. no, it's fine. And if you if your answer is no, it's fine. Then you know it's it's just this external public pressure, and who cares? You know, <laughs> I mean, right. I mean, we should care because our children are social beings, and we do want to help them, give them the the tools to survive in society. But I think it's helpful to make that distinction, like okay, I want to help you, you know, behave appropriately because this is what society demands. And that's different than saying you are misbehaving. We have to correct this. Basically, it puts the problem on society and not on your child, right? It took me a hot minute, though, to really gauge. And, and I think that was one of the hard things about deconstructing alone was to kind of gauge what those societal 
norms really mm-hmm. are. Uh, because, you know, in my situation, I was alone mm-hmm. for so long and still am mm-hmm. when it comes to my parenting. Uh, and just like from being disfellowshipped and leaving the faith and everything all at once, um, of kind of recreating what those social norms are mm-hmm. that we want to kind of help instill. Mm-hmm. But I, I love that illustration that you gave about the island. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that's a good like way to look at it, a good way to gauge it, yeah. a good scale. Yeah. I, and I mean, everything is a social construct, right? <laughs> we yeah, made everything yeah. up. And so... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But I do think <laughs> that... Um, I think one gift of deconstruction is i think we were so afraid to like leave the fold or whatever because you just feel like there's no life no life after <laughs> um and right. and that there's <laughs> that there's like it, it's a scarcity <laughs> mindset like oh we're gonna have so mm. much less resources we're gonna have so much less friends and it's like that doesn't have to be true you know like that's right. use our imagination well, that's the pioneer way yeah let's just if the pioneer way is to find these things that are missing and for us to start creating them ourselves exactly right? yeah and so like with our kids okay we don't go to vbs anymore um doesn't it's not the end <laughs> of the world God. there's a right there's other things to do and there's other ways to to be to be a child um like I was, uh, someone on Twitter was asking about whether or not there's like a progressive youth group. And I'm just like, you know, uh-huh. we don't need to find replacements for what we had right. in evangelicalism. You know, we can just do new things. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there there might be like a good way to do that, like an ethical society or something. But mm-hmm. uh, good God, teenagers terrify me. <laughs> God, yeah. I just yeah. I don't want to have to. I hate to break it to you, Brady, but them. you have like a little mini one right now coming. Yeah, he's like a <laughs> ticking time bomb. Well, you know, it's funny because I like I was mentioning earlier about being very self conscious about my how my son behaves, you know, around people or whatever. Mm-hmm. And my kid is one of the most well behaved. He's seriously children. a little angel. He is such he's a, a little, little nerd hyper, child, little, yeah. Yeah. and I love it. Um, he is the spitting image of of who I was, and it 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 is easy for me at times to project, and I have to be careful not to do mm-hmm. that. Be, like you were mentioning earlier, and he's not my little therapist at all, mm-hmm. because one of the things that I have to overcome and the big thing that was in my past was um, kind of picking up a lot of my parents' problems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I have to be self-aware to make sure that I don't do that shit on mm-hmm. him right. and make sure that I break that cycle because, right. you know, we don't need the generational curse. Yeah. And the awareness <laughs> is such a, such a, key you know like just just the fact that you're aware i think makes a huge difference right i mean we we, we're not perfect we're not going to be able to be you know change it every time but just being aware i think is is so important yeah i feel like our like our the boomers uh, were just completely oblivious to the fact that they have generational trauma (laughs) like every single one of them you know what i mean well was it they didn't know about it on on some level like they just didn't have the resources to understand that but like also it's like now that they're here (laughs) yeah yeah it's like the calvary's arrived you can you could lay off a little bit and just listen the calvary's (laughs) arrived it's true yeah i mixed mixed metaphors there i don't know why we're listening to it the trauma the trauma calvary are we the trauma calvary (laughs) the trauma i think we're the trauma calvary (laughs) <laughs> I th- I think Marlene Winell and Marlene Winell is the leave, real trauma. We'll leave that to, uh, <laughs> for sure. More professional. We'll leave it to Ross. Child. You know, it's interesting. We'll I feel like, like my kids are really well behaved as well, and it's it's weird because mm-hmm. now I'm like you know this progressive parent. I want my kids to like rebel and dissent, and and then they're not at all. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it almost more worries Minecraft me a little arm. bit, yeah. like come on, you know, don't, because exactly. It reminds me of who I was. Like I was so good. I was such a rule follower. Oh, so was I. Do you ever feel, do you ever feel in the position that you're in culturally, like pressure for your kids to like be good or be okay? Cause like you're rebelling against the, the parenting that That is such a good question. You were like, you know, like you're, you're telling even you're telling evangelicals they're wrong. Does that ever make you nervous? Uh, well, I mean, that, I mean, that ship ever, has sailed, ever, right? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I guess so. I mean, I, I, I guess what I mean is like, okay, so if like when I deconstructed my faith, I don't have kids, but like, for example, like, you know, there's like the prodigal son or something. And I was, I was like, there's part of me that was afraid that my life was just going to completely melt down and I was going to end up crawling back or something. Mm-hmm. You know you what I mean? A like I would have to admit, yeah. yeah, right. That I would become a parent. No, that, that I would have to admit that I was wrong in my rebellion against what I was raised to believe. Yeah. Do you ever, no, do you ever feel that? No, I not anymore. I don't know if so ever because yeah, like okay. I'm pretty Great. sure of Good what I'm me. rejecting, you know, like I'm pretty Good. sure yeah, yeah, yeah. that T- being taught that you're a sinner, like I'm pretty sure that's bad. Sure. Yeah. sure. Good. So yeah, no, cool. I don't. I like that reassurance. I mean, I understand. Uh, I want to be empathetic to people who do worry about that. I think it's just not my personality, my personality. Sure. I'm just kind of like, hmm. no, that's not right. And I'm not never that's going not back it. to it. And I'm pretty sure I'm not doing my children injustice by by not repeating those that that way, you know. Very well, good. I think part of what he was asking too is do you feel like you have to be a parenting success to kind of prove that you did the right thing by leaving it? You know what yeah. I mean? Is there kind of like that? Well, I, that, I, f- I think I feel that for myself. I feel like maybe I have to show the world that I'm thriving um, yes, as okay. an ex evangelical. So I, I do feel it a little bit. Um, but the, but but the reality like is I am. Thrive. I think I'm much. <laughs> I'm thriving a lot more outside, yeah. so it's not yeah. right. it's not hard <laughs> to to right, prove it. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, so I feel pretty good about that. I was always thinking about you know those pastors in fundamentalist cultures that really emphasize that if they have kids that aren't part of the faith, then they shouldn't be pastors, mm-hmm. or you know they have really have to care for their kids mm-hmm. and their family to be able to prove that they should be in charge of a church or something. Yeah. And that was kind of a big deal with some of the cultures I came from because one of my pastors he had a daughter around my age and she rebelled. God, I hate that phrasing. I know, right? <laughs> like she phrasing. she left the faith for a while and. <laughs> It was this big ordeal, and it was kind of like a very Hamlet-like drama, oh, of like, a drama of like, mm. uh, should I resign or should I stay? Oh God! Uh, yeah. You All know, right, John and- Piper. <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was kind of this this ordeal of um, how do you respond to it? You know, how does your family's behavior reflect on your ability to? And oh my God, so patriarchal because all of this stuff is, hey man, yeah. uh, how good are you well, at the, controlling the people around yeah, you? Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on parents and evangelicalism to succeed. Yeah. Right? So I guess I guess maybe that's where my where my last question came from it's yeah. like you know i'm still maybe i'm still stuck in that mindset yeah. of like you are 100 percent responsible for your children's success I, Ugh, and i God, feel like I you know that. like gay people they maybe feel like they have to raise perfect uh, kids too right um, right yeah, yeah i mean i feel like i have to do extra as a gay guy right. you know to kind of like uh prove that i can do it right yeah, and you that's know, so or that I, I'm, I'm capable, even as a single parent, you know, it's kind of like a double whammy for me right now. Yeah. But what were you saying, Cynthia? I, I feel like, I feel like I, I, you know, like I want space. I want the right to fail um, as well. Mm, so right. like we talked a little bit about some recent evangelical drama on Twitter. Like, I almost think sure, it's yeah. good. Like we get to fail too. Like it doesn't have to be perfect. Mm. We're not perfect. You know, things break down just as much like, and that's just Mm. human. Um, And I feel like we should be able to, we should get that as well. Right. And, and, and I mean, like maybe it's sort of uh, as an, as the ex evangelical or post evangelical community to say like, to like make sure that everybody has room Mm -hmm. to do that because the, because the, our parents and, and our families and, and our churches and the places we came from are not going to give us that. They're going to jump on, uh, at least in most cases, they're going to jump on any opportunity to like point out to you mm-hmm. in what ways you're, you're coming up short because you've abandoned their you know, belief system or whatever. Right. So it's, I guess that there's a little bit more maybe of a responsibility for us as a community to remind each other that we can be mm-hmm. failure. Well, not, you know not be failures i guess but i mean we can <laughs> but like we can fail you know well and to not Cindy, look did... back to evangelicalism for validity right 
Right. Right. Ooh. Right. Right. Yeah. I saw a meme today. It was about uh, you can't find healing at the feet of where you got hurt, or mm-hmm. something along those lines. The but feet the idea. Of Jesus. Oh, please stop. <laughs> but this idea that uh, evangelicalism almost becomes like a father figure to us that we want its oh, approval, and yeah. we also want to kill it at the same time. <laughs> that's all of that's everybody's relationship with their fathers, mm. right? Is uh, that am I reading yeah, into that? I mean, that's, that yeah, we all yeah. want to kill a man, get accepted. Yeah, sh- yeah no? sure, Brady. Yeah. Just me, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah th- it's just getting deep <laughs> right, we're, gonna, we're gonna get into into brady's daddy issues <laughs> so uh cindy i was i was homeschooled i have a really interesting like we could talk about my parenting situation all day mm-hmm. but uh i try not to talk too much about my parents on the show because they're living people yeah and, um but uh i was homeschooled and and can we talk a little bit about Christian education, because you went to several Christian, your, almost your entire education was Christian. Is that, is that right? So from, from grade school, you went to a school for, or like a school run by missionaries? Yeah. Well, actually I didn't, I started going to that school in sixth grade. So from sixth grade on, I was in that school run for missionaries. And yeah, when I was in grade school, I was actually in an Anglican school, which is interesting. Um, but oh, it was yeah. like, I remember getting traumatized by like Jesus pictures because they usually have the nails in his hands still. Oh, yeah, yeah, so that was scary yeah. as a young kid. But, um, but, mm-hmm. it, but it, was, it wasn't until the conservative evangelical school that I think the spiritual damage started for me because it was so mm-hmm. into like conversion and, um, you know, and the, the four spiritual laws, like all that stuff. Oh, yeah. So mm-hmm. Damaging. So... Yeah, and then that the whole you know this whole subculture, the ethos. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's. I mean, it's. It's. It's bizarre, really. So I. I was homeschooled through ninth grade, and then in tenth grade, I went to a Christian college prep school that was like they claimed to be non-denominational, but they were like actually super Presbyterian. Okay. And uh, and it was just like it was this weird. I mean, I don't even know how to talk about it, but like high school was a weird intersection of like, of like wealthy white culture mm-hmm. and evangelicalism, yeah. which is its own kind of weird. And then grade school was like a lot of, I mean, I used a Becca curriculum and then I used, <laughs> quote, uh, I used sunlight curriculum, which I don't know mm-hmm. is not nearly as, as popular, but it's was like, it S-O-N-E? S- similar. Uh, of course it was. Oh my God. Yeah. Fuck that. S- sunlight. <laughs> Sun is in. Cause sun. Jesus is the light. Yeah. Clear. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, did you, did you encounter these like super biased curriculums? Did you not learn about evolution? Is that the kind of environment you were in? Yes. Um, like in high school, I think my high school, middle school, high school was, was, well, Wheaton, I went to Wheaton College, which is pretty conservative, but at Wheaton, I felt like there was at least more space for, um, the discussion on evolution. Um, but yeah, my high school, I think we were definitely advised against evolution and, taught to Mm -hmm, kind mm -hmm. of fear it and but yeah i'm not as familiar with homeschooling because i wasn't homeschooled in fact my home sure sure that's yeah of course yeah yeah. um but you know it's like i didn't know better i didn't i didn't know we we were really into integrating faith and academics like that was you know the worldview Uh integration did you guys learn about that like Worldview in a like, oh boy like, did I I took I had a whole worldview course. Well, just like you're supposed to weave the Bible into everything, so everything had to yes, be yes, connected yes, to yeah. the faith, and and so that yeah, like my one of my math teachers gave a lesson about the golden mean, and it was like trying to prove that God existed because the golden mean exists. It was. Anyway. Yeah, it was so forced. It was so forced. <laughs> yes, very, very forced. Yeah. yeah. Um. So that was a really big deal. At Wheaton was the same. We had to write papers on how everything is supposed to be integrated to the Christian uh-huh. worldview, basically. Um, uh huh. So yeah, I there. I mean, there's, and that's just a huge part of my deconstruction is just realizing what a biased um, education that I had. But, but I realized that this is, this is true even beyond Christian education, right? Like mm-hmm. a lot of curriculum, even in public schools are super racist and doesn't depict accurate sure, history. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I think it's, yeah, it's a problem. Well, beyond. 
That okay, so let's talk about that for a minute because the the prospect of modern Christian education like post 1950, mm-hmm. like post 1950, 1960 mm-hmm. and like that kind of racist curriculum and like the alternative histories of the United States mm-hmm. and, you know, the rise of evangelicalism in the 80s and 90s. Those are all related right. in a really bizarre way. Like yeah. they're all part of a machine, right? Right, right. right. Yeah, I, I feel like our friend Chris Stroop could tease this out a lot. Yeah, I know, right? Let's just three. Yeah. Let's just call. Call let's Chris. Three way call Chris right now. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I know he said a lot of good things. I know he's so he's so smart. He knows how everything's connected, yeah. and and I'm glad to learn from him that it is because yeah, yeah. I, I'm not aware. I do feel like yeah, evangelicalism's influence is so pervasive and. Um, so, so yeah, I think we're just constantly have to keep our eyes clear and to question everything, basically, you know, this right. is why like teaching our kids critical thinking is so important. It's like you, you have to be vigilant all the time with, yeah. you know, with everything. How do you, how are you teaching your kids critical thinking skills? Like, is that something that you're like, you sit down and there's a book you're going through or Help me out with I that. think it's more just a, a posture. Like I teach them and I mean, I don't know if I'm effective, but I try to tell them that you, you can't believe everything you see. And this is, this is good advice for, for the internet, for, <laughs> you know, for people right. in general. For peekaboo. And I do even talk, talk about their teachers. I was like, don't believe everything your teachers say, you know, <laughs> like, and not to teach them disrespect, but to teach them. Sure dissent really right like right question everything um and and i and i have to say you got to question your parents as well which is hard to say Uh uh-huh but yeah you should question what your parents are telling you as well (laughs) because you know let's face it we all right in our adulthood have figured out some of the things our parents said to us is not true (laughs) (laughs) One or two, one or two. Like, yeah. you know, like the things. microwave, you know, like you can't stand in front of the microwave. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right, right. I yeah. still, family, I'm still was living just fear when thing. I stand in front of the microwave. <laughs> you were indoctrinated. Uh, my family's microwave just natural culture. posture was trying to get people to believe the stupidest shit as possible. <laughs> so like my brother, you know, my brother would like point the remote control to me and keep on pressing it. And he's like, I'm going to give you cancer if I keep doing this. <laughs> and I, I can't run away because he's just going to keep running at me. You know? but, the fam, the family is the world's greatest purveyor of misinformation. Like, there's no, yeah. there's no greater source of misinformation than like asking your mom something that she doesn't really know the answer to, but she just like out of obligation. Yeah. Yeah. If gives you, you something if you anyway. touch that baby bird, it's mom's going to reject it. Oh, oh, Who came up with that gosh, shit? That's not that. even. A, Everyone in the it's Midwest. Mom's gonna, yeah, it's like we all Midwest, believe that yeah. here in the Midwest. But then I realized, no, that's not the truth. But this is <laughs> those babies are so okay. The kids are all right. A huge part of, particularly, I guess Mar- Marlene Wynell's model for for religious trauma syndrome mm-hmm. is n- lack of or just not having critical thinking skills, mm-hmm. right? Because everything, especially for people that were raised in church from like day one or from a really early age, right. everything is just told to you and you're not you're really not supposed to question it like they like there are certain questions you're allowed to ask Mm -hmm. and be like a a good questioner Mm -hmm. you know but like questioning the big things like how do we know jesus rose from the dead right is like not a not a great one right well what you guys were saying about curriculum and indoctrination earlier i was thinking about when i went to christian college each one of our courses each one of the classes whether it was a you know evangelical class or what started off with us talking about how we know that the bible is the absolute truth because it tells us that it is the absolute truth so it was just kind of like that was our first lesson in everything was well, the Bible says that the entire Bible is inspired. So yeah. now we can work from that as our, you know, as our capstone yeah. and go on from there. Right. Yeah. <sighs> Where do we even begin with the whole Bible thing? <laughs> <laughs> the whole Bible thing. <laughs> you know, what do you mean? What do you mean? What it's do you mean? just like the root of all problems. It's the same. <laughs> it seems like. Yeah, it, it is. This, you know, the biblicism. It's, it's so, yeah, it's so. You just can't have a conversation. You can't have dialogue about it because it's uh-huh. held in such high esteem that's it, that that it doesn't deserve. You know. 
Right. But I want to say one more thing yeah. about the critical thinking thing. I yeah, I yeah. feel like critical thinking is something you have to develop, right? Like, you know, think about college mm -hmm. students as compared to high school students. They just, because their brain has developed, they're able to think even more critically. So, like, I don't mm -hmm. think we have to be in a hurry to get our kids to be, you know... <laughs> high level discourse debaters at sixth grade. Um, but I think point, there are yeah. really important things that we can do to uh, reinforce their autonomy um, and their agency, mm -hmm. which I think is the foundation mm -hmm. of becoming a critical thinker because getting them to like trust themselves and know that they have control over their own lives and their own thoughts and ideas like those are human rights that we have to give to our children. Mm. And and you can mm. do that in age development ways, age appropriate ways, right? Like for little kids, I talk about this in my book, like giving them choice and, you know, what they eat or or just just in in lots of little ways to build up their autonomy. Um so and then hopefully as they grow, then they can lean into their intuition as they develop, as they learn new academic skills and social skills, um, they have that as a foundation. Autonomy, yeah. man. I don't, I mean, like, that wasn't a concept for me until I was like 25. That's because you know, we grew 26. up evangelical. <laughs> yeah, no, right. I know exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, we it were given schema, but we weren't given reasons. Um, we were given actions to do, but not really thought out reasons of why to do them. Sure. Yeah. And so whenever, you know, those schema were kind of stopped, then we had to recreate. And, uh, but with recreating, we're able to do that in a way that reflects what we believe now. And so that kind of changed mm -hmm. everybody's yeah. recreation. Mm, that's so interesting. Building how we like act. That. Yeah. Um, Cindy, before we let you go, what are some of the things that you are working on now and things that you've got coming down yeah, what the pipes? Is, what, do our, what does our audience need to know? Yeah, I am launching a big project. I've decided to create a online conference um, on Parenting Forward, and it's the intersection of parenting and progressive faith. Um, I have I will have at least 20 speakers who will talk about parenting oh, cool. and progressive faith. Um, so we'll talk a lot about justice and spirituality and parenting. Um, so that will happen in September, but you can go to the website and register if you are interested. The website is um, parentingforwardconference.com. So I'd love for Wonderful. your listeners to go check that out. Yes. I would and love to go check it out. You have a podcast as well uh, by the name of Parenting Forward. We saw one of our friends, Corey Pig, was on there recently. Chris Stroop is also on there recently. Yes. Yeah, oh, we Christmas talked about mm -hmm. exposed oh, Christian schools. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's right. Maybe that's why I, I started on that rant about... <laughs> Yeah, and I about have a the couple of, of episodes education. on there that talk about the difference between fundamentalist parenting and progressive parenting. So, cool. yeah. So, yeah. Very cool. Yeah, I think that'd be really approachable. I think our our listeners would love that because parenting just isn't anything we haven't touched that much. And so That's I'd true. love that we're able to kind of push them on to some other uh, resources that we know we can trust. Yeah, are there any other are there any other resources that people should know about? Well, there's my Facebook group which is really active. It's um Cool. It's okay. called Raising Children Unfundamentalist. And that's on Facebook. Okay. Um, cool. And my book, Parenting Forward, which we talked a lot about. Well, Cindy, thank you so much for yeah. joining us on the show. Uh, we also want to remind our listeners, um, in addition to checking out her podcast, um, you can also get on and find ours to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes. And Chuck, will you tell our listeners about our online podcast? Um, closed facebook group yeah uh yeah so we have a uh a private uh facebook group that people that are not a allowed in by the gatekeepers cannot see so it's a uh safe space to process your deconstruction deconversion to hash out your feelings to talk about your difficult family dynamics or or lost relationships or whatever it is you're you're struggling with it's a very active community and uh we're we're happy to uh, be there and, and support you in that capacity. And we have a Patreon if you'd like to. Oh, and it's called the the Life After Secret Community. Oh. It, it, you have to search and then you have to answer a series of questions and then. What is your favorite color? Yeah, like what's your favorite no, color? Kidding. 
and better uh, questions than that. And which Back to the Future movie was the best? <laughs> and then. <laughs> Cindy, thanks so much for being on the yeah, show. Thank you so thank much. Thank you Cindy. for having this me. It's really been good it's time. so nice to meet you and to hang out. Thank you so much, Cindy, and uh, we will be seeing you in the online ex evangelical post fundamentalist online universe. Online universe. <laughs> uh, thanks everybody thank for you. listening. And bye. Yeah. Thank. Bye. bye. bye.